Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Taylor. I'm a director of Cambridge University Press, which is proud to have published Professor Shane Weller's most recent book, Language and Negativity in European Modernism, earlier this year, and also to have signed up the book that he's currently writing, The Idea of Europe and Intellectual History, closely tied to the theme of this evening's talk. And we hope to publish that book in 2021. Shane is Head of School and Professor of Comparative Literature in the School of European Culture and Languages at the University of Kent, which describes itself as the UK's European University. He's also co-director of the Centre for Modern European Literature there, as well as the general editor of the Paul Grave Studies in Modern European Literature book series. The prevalence of the E-word among his credentials tells us that there could hardly be a more appropriate person to address it, nor a more timely moment for him to do so, given the very fine and precarious balance in which our relations with that institution, that entity, that continent, culture, that idea, currently quite literally hang. And it's refreshing indeed at this fevered moment to be able to stand back a bit and take a broader, uh, more historically informed view. And so it gives me great pleasure to invite Shane to talk to us about Europe, the history of an idea, which he will do for about 40 minutes, leaving ample time, 15 or 20 minutes towards the end, for your questions and discussion. Shane. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind, generous uh, introduction, uh, Evan. And it's uh, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to see so many of you here. I have to I have to uh, admit that uh, I'm aware of the of the of the topicality of the topic, <laughs> uh, and I've been checking my phone today on the way from uh, Canterbury to Cambridge just to make sure there haven't been any last minute uh, developments, and uh, still all to play for clearly. Um, I am going to I am going to talk today about uh, Europe uh, rather than uh, the European Union, and I'm not going to really say anything about uh, Brexit. Um, but there will, as Kevin said, there'll be uh, 20 minutes or so at the end for a um, for questions and answers. And I'm absolutely I'm very happy for you to ask questions uh, pertaining to that uh, subject uh, then. Uh, if, 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 that would, uh, if that would be of interest to you. Um, the, I suppose one could say, for many Europeans, um, the question of Europe has become, alongside climate change, one of our most um, urgent preoccupations. And as I will show a little later, there's, there's a connection between the idea of Europe and uh, the reality of um, climate change. Uh, one can, of course, read on an almost daily basis about the various threats that are facing the European Union. Those threats are far from being limited to Brexit. And about the possibility of uh, Europe even entering a, a new dark age in which nationalist populism would undo many of the political and economic and cultural achievements of the post-Second World War era. My question, though, is, is the following. What exactly are we referring to when we speak about Europe? It's easy enough to agree, uh, I think, on what constitutes the European Union, even if there are very different perspectives on that union's advantages and disadvantages. One can have a map. One can identify the countries that are part of the European uh, Union. One can establish precisely when they became part of that uh, union. But the same cannot be said, uh, I think, of Europe the more generally. Uh, what, for instance, are Europe's borders, especially to the east? Is Russia part of Europe? Or is part of Russia part of Europe? And what about Turkey? And if Russia and Turkey and other countries are not part of what we mean when we talk about Europe, why not? The truth, I think, is that 
And we could do a poll here right now and ask each of you to write down what you think Europe is, and we'd probably have 80 different <laughs> answers to precisely what formed part and what form didn't form part of Europe. Moreover, does Europe have a shared culture? And what are the sources of that culture if we think that it does? Are there distinctly European values that we could identify? And how is the European to be distinguished from the non-European? Now, as it happens, these are questions with a very long history. For reflections upon the idea of Europe date back over two and a half thousand years to the ancient Greeks. And if one looks back at that long history, one is immediately struck, I think, by how often the very same questions, and indeed the very same answers to those questions, have recurred in seemingly very distinct historical contexts. As I hope to show you in this evening's talk, as we reflect on Europe today, or on possible futures for Europe, there are some interesting lessons that might be learned from history. Now, there's a voice in the back of my head at this moment recalling something that wasn't said by the German philosopher Hegel, but got turned into something uh, more, uh, more uh, Twitterish, uh, which is the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. Uh, and I'm rather hoping that's not the case when it comes to the history of Europe. But in fact, I have to say, having worked on this topic for a while, I quite often feel as though we're not really doing that well on learning from the history of this idea. So let's go all the way back to one of the first recorded references to Europe as a distinct geographical area. And that's to be found in uh, what we now know as the Homeric hymns. They're associated with Homer, whether or not they were authored by Homer is another matter. And these date from the late 7th, early 6th century um, BC. The first really extended engagement with the idea of Europe, however, occurs a century or so later in the work of the great uh, Greek historian Herodotus. In his histories, Herodotus refers on more than one occasion to Europe. He does so, however, with a considerable degree of skepticism. And skepticism, you'll see, is going to be an abiding theme of my talk this evening. So for instance, having considered some of the claims made regarding the derivation of the names Libya and Asia, Herodotus turns his attention to the origin of the name Europe, uh, Europe. And he refers readers to the myth of the rape of Europa. And there's the image by Titian, the rape of Europa. You see Europa there with the, with the bull. Uh, it was done 2,000 years um, later, that, uh, that image. So he refers readers to this myth. And in that myth, a princess whose name is Europa and who's the daughter of the king of Tyre in Phoenicia, which is present-day Lebanon, she's abducted and she's raped by the king of the gods, Zeus, who comes to her in the form of a bull and deposits her ultimately on the island of Crete. Now, Herodotus argues that Europa was, in fact, not European at all, but Asian, coming from Lebanon, uh, and that she, and I quote him, never even set foot on the land which the Greeks now call Europe. In short, then, Herodotus calls into question the very distinction between Europe and Asia. Now, despite his skepticism with regard to our being able to identify anything that we might call Europe in a Greek geographical sense, the attempt to distinguish Europe from Asia becomes a primary concern of those who would reflect on the idea of Europe in the classical period and um, beyond. Indeed, I would say the distinction that they try to make between Europe and Asia is in many ways as critical to the future of Europe as the distinction that the ancient Greeks try to make between the human and the animal. So just as the Parthenon freezes depict the violent struggle of human beings to overcome their own animality, and you see represented there in the form of the half-human, half, -human, half 
animal centaurs, which the, the Greeks are fighting against. This attempt to overcome or uh, uh, transcend their animality. So those who reflected in the classical period on the idea of Europe tried to highlight its difference from Asia. Writing in the first century BC, for instance, Hippocrates declares, I wish to show respecting Asia and Europe how in all respects they differ from one another. Now for Hippocrates, this distinction is not simply a cultural one. It's also ethnic and it has profound political consequences. Hippocrates considers what he terms the Asiatic race to be, in his terms, feeble. And he observes that, quote, monarchy prevails in the greater part of Asia, where men are not their own masters, but are the slaves of others. As for Europeans, they, Hippocrates says, are more warlike than the Asians, Asians more courageous than the Asians. Indeed, Europeans, he says, are wild and unsociable, and thus much more inclined to value freedom. Now, this conception of the fundamental difference between European and Asian civilization would have a long history, extending all the way into the 20th and 21st centuries. It sees Europe as a civilization of the free individual, and Asia as a civilization of the enslaved collective. It was during the early days of the Roman Empire that the myth of Europa took on its full geopolitical charge. And it played a very significant role in the cultural establishment of Rome in the, as the perceived center of Europe, again in contradistinction to Asia. The myth, the myth of Europa's abduction by Zeus is, for instance, the subject, now Jupiter, the subject of a poem in Horace's Odes, which were published around 23 BC during the reign of um, Augustus. In Horace's version, the abducted Europa is comforted by the goddess Venus, who promises Europa enduring fame. Uh, Horace writes, this is Venus speaking, you do not know that you, this is Europa, are the wife of almighty Jupiter. No more sobbing, you must learn to endure your great good fortune. Half of the world will bear your name. Now that half of the world, of course, is the Roman Empire. And Horace's poem serves to mark this new sense of a Roman Europe, albeit one that extends into North Africa and that excludes what we now consider Eastern Europe because the Roman Empire didn't extend very far into Eastern Europe. It came up against the Germanic tribes and decided that it would stop there. So you've got to imagine this idea of Europe as extending into North Africa, but not extending very far into uh, what we now see as uh, Eastern Europe. Having played this really important role in Roman imperial culture, the idea of Europe would go on to play a no less significant role in the construction of what came to be known as Christendom, uh, to the point where Christendom and Europe came to be seen in the Middle Ages as synonymous. Indeed, it was not too much of an exaggeration to say that from the time of Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, again in North Africa, until the 18th century Enlightenment, uh, the idea of Europe was largely subsumed within the idea of Christendom. Seen in this way, the idea of Europe mapped onto the distinction between the Christian and the Islamic worlds. Then in the early modern period, the impact of the discovery of the new world, 1492, necessitated a rethinking of the long-held conception of the world of consi as consisting of three parts. In the classical age, the world was seen as consisting of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Obviously that had to change in the 15th and 16th centuries. The result was a conception of Europe as the geographical and cultural center of the world in the sense that it represented civilization. It saw itself as representing civilization as opposed to barbarism. Renaissance humanism was very much the humanism of the European. Now this Eurocentric idea of the world lies then at the heart of the 18th century enlightenment and its thinking of uh, Europe. So 
If you turn to the year 1756, the French Encyclopedia, Encyclopédie, Europe there, this was, this was, the sort of, this was supposed to be the, the document that encapsulated all uh, knowledge. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an entry on Europe, and Europe is identified in that 1756 edition as being the smallest of the four parts of the world. So now there are four. Its geographical dimensions notwithstanding, however, it is, according to the encyclopedists, the greatest of all in its trade, its exploration, its agricultural yield, in its enlightenment, and the industriousness of its peoples. See, I'm quoting from the encyclopedia here. In its knowledge of the arts, the sciences, and trades, and most importantly of all, in its Christianity, whose benefit Moral, whose beneficent moral teachings bring nothing but happiness to society. Of course, no mention is being made here in the encyclopedia of the destructive impact of European colonialism on the indigenous cultures of the Americas. The French uh, encyclopedist's conception of Europe, which is, as you can see from this um, quotation, Eurocentric and Euro-idealizing, sees Europe as the center of the world, and it sees Europe as essentially a perfect incarnation of civilization. This is characteristic of much Enlightenment thinking in the, late, in the mid to late 18th century in Europe, on the idea of Europe. It doesn't, though, capture the really key role played by the idea of Europe during that period, the 18th century. For the idea of Europe served Enlightenment thinkers primarily as a powerful resource in response to the wars of religion which had swept across Europe in the name of various strains of Christianity in the 16th and 17th century. One of the primary concerns during the Enlightenment was to establish a lasting peace between the European nation states. The source for many of uh, these reflections on peace in Europe and on the idea of Europe in relation to that, was a tract published by someone who's now pretty unknown, published in 1713, the Abbé de Saint-Pierre. He published a tract called The Project for Perpetual Peace. And Article 8 in that tract, charter, reads as follows. No sovereign shall take up arms or commit any hostility but against him who shall be declared an enemy of European society. Now, this is one of the first occasions on which a writer identifies such a thing as European society. And this will become a cornerstone of Enlightenment thinking. And it slowly replaces the idea of Europe and Christendom as being synonymous. And one of the most preeminent figures of the French Enlightenment, the great writer and all-round intellectual Voltaire, wrote in the same year, 1756, as the, as the, as the encyclopedia, in what a flourishing state Europe would be without the continuous wars which trouble it for very minor interests and often for tiny whims. A decade later, Voltaire could even see signs of a new Europe emerging, a Europe shaped by the Enlightenment idea of the cosmopolitan intellectual. This idea of the cosmopolitan intellectual, uh, the person whom a former prime minister described as a, as a citizen of nowhere, actually originates here in the French Enlightenment. Uh, I see with pleasure, Voltaire wrote, that an immense republic of cultivated minds is taking shape in Europe. Now this cosmopolitan, if also decidedly elitist ideal, was to founder in the course of the 19th century, in no small part on, on account of an idea of Europe that emerged out of the French Revolution and out of European Romanticism, particularly of the German strain. And if you're thinking about where we are today in Europe, and you're thinking about the, the nature of the EU, the threats to the EU, attitudes towards the EU, it's at this moment with the, with the, the French Revolution and the European Romanticism that follows on it that uh, one sees the real roots of that, um, that situation. Now, European Romanticism was a complex, multifaceted, and indeed contradictory movement. On the one hand, 
It was profoundly international, and this is evidenced not least by a journal entitled Europa. This was established by one of the foremost German romantics, Friedrich Schlegel. In 1799, another German romantic, who went by the pen name Novalis, wrote a long essay entitled Europe or Christendom that looked back nostalgically to a pre-Reformation Catholic Europe. He put, as he put it there, there were once beautiful, splendid times when Europe was a Christian land, when one Christendom dwelt in this continent shaped by human hand, one great common interest bound together the most distant provinces of this broad religious empire. In contrast, in a work published in 1784 entitled Ideas for a Philosophy of the History of Mankind, another German philosopher, Johann Gottfried Herder, identified Europe's value as lying in its diversity, its cultural and ethnic diversity. And he highlighted what he saw as the positive effects of migration. In no other part of the world, Herder wrote, has there been such a mingling of peoples as in Europe? And he considered this mingling of peoples to be the decisive factor in the emergence of what he saw as Europe's, what he called Europe's universal spirit. This emphasis on the universality of the European spirit would serve as the perfect ideological underpinning for the age of European imperialism. European civilization and European values were to be imposed upon the rest of the world because they were universal. The point is made very clearly by uh, Friedrich Schlegel in his lectures on modern history from the same period. There he claims that it is the rich ethnic variety of Europe that, and I quote him, makes Europe what it is and that confers on Europe the distinction of being the chief seat of all human civilization. Now, I mentioned that the romantic thinking of the idea of Europe was, was complex, uh, multifaceted, and even contradictory. And this is evident not least in the fact that alongside such claims for the universality of European civilization and of the European spirit, as they called it, there was also a strand of romantic thinking that championed not ethnic mingling, but pronounced national differences. Just as medieval Europe had been ripped apart by the wars of religion, with Protestant fighting Catholic, so now national differences would be the really decisive force. Can I go back to that? One of the key figures in this respect was the German idealist philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte, and in 1806-1807, he delivered in Berlin, which was at the time occupied by Napoleon's troops, what he billed as his Addresses to the German Nation. In these lectures, he championed the idea of the, European, of the German nation as the foremost among the European peoples, with its own particular spirit and its own particular fate. Out of Napoleon's ultimately doomed attempt to create by might of arms a unified Europe with its center in Paris, there emerged in the first half of the 19th century an increasingly strident nationalist separatist wave which culminated in the political realization of the German nation in the aftermath, aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-1871. To get a taste of just how much had changed between Voltaire's time, celebrating the, the uh, cosmopolitan, and Fichte's time, one need only read uh, Fichte's essay on what he calls the self-contained commercial state, which was published in 1800. I'm sure Donald Trump has read this text because it reads as though it had been written by Donald Trump. There, Fichte argues that um, he argues for a form of radical economic nationalism, and he declares that, quote, only the scholar and the superior artist needs to travel outside the self-contained commercial state. It is evident, he writes, that a nation thus isolated, whose members live only among themselves and very little with foreigners, 
will in the course of time acquire its own way of life, its own peculiar organization and manner, and will love the homeland and everything in it. Such a nation, he writes, will rapidly develop a strong sense of national honor as well as a clearly marked national character. Fichte's dream was of a German nation and a distinctly Germanic culture. Despite two world wars, both of which began as European wars triggered by nationalist fervor, the sh shadow of that nationalist dream continues to fall across Europe to this day. I think what is most striking in the second half of the 19th century is just how far the idea of Europe that was being discussed diverged from the reality of European history. Time and again, one finds champions of the idea of Europe as a federation and even a United States of Europe is theorized. One of the most influential, indeed, uh, one of the most uh, influential champions of the European idea in the mid-19th century was the novelist, poet, painter, and again, all-round intellectual, Victor Hugo, who is best known today for novels such as Notre Dame de Paris uh, and Les Miserables. Like, like many of those in favor of a united Europe, however, Hugo could not prevent his own national prejudices from shaping his argument. And this is one of the problems that one sees arising time and again when thinkers try to imagine Europe. They always tie it in some way to their own uh, particular nation. So for Hugo, who argued for a United States of Europe, Europe was essentially France and Germany. In a long work entitled The Rhine, you see the river uh, connecting, separating France and Germany from 1842, 1845, he writes, what is still standing in Europe? Only two nations, France and Germany. Well, that could be enough. France and Germany are essentially Europe. Germany is the heart, France is the head. Germany and France are essentially civilization. Germany feels, France thinks. It's not particularly appealing to any of the other nations in Europe to read that. Now, his optimistic vision of Europe and its future uh, took the form of a new European nation state, which would be based on the model of existing nation states. And in 17, in 1876, he wrote an essay called For Serbia. Uh, in that, he said, he wrote, Europe needs a European nationality, a single government, an immense brotherly arbitration, democracy in peace with itself, all sister nations having as their city and center Paris. That is to say, freedom having light for its capital. In a word, the United States of Europe. Yeah. So if you're, if you're not really in favor of the EU, you can go back and you can cite people like Hugo. Uh, and, and, and it's a clear case there of somebody looking to shape Europe in the image of their own uh, nation state. By the time he came to write that essay, however, the first in a series of new, decidedly modern European wars had broken out. I referred to it earlier, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871. The consequences of this war would wreck for almost a century Victor Hugo's vision of a European Union in which France and Germany would be, as he put it, brothers. It was in the wake of that war that cultural commentators began to realize that Europe's future was likely to be anything but that of the Enlightenment dreamers of perpetual um, peace. In many respects, a child of certain strains of German Romanticism the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was among the first to see the all too bloody writing on the wall at this moment in history. In response to the rising nationalist sentiments in a Germany dominated by Prussia, in the 1880s, Nietzsche championed the idea of what he termed the, what he termed the good European. What did he mean by this? He meant a cosmopolitan who would recognize and oppose what he described as nationalist nonsense and that had, as he put it, alienated and continues to alienate the peoples of Europe from each other. It was, however, the nationalists whose vision of Europe would prevail. And in the later decades of the 19th century, a new racial theory of what was termed homo 
Europeus, European man, emerged. It culminated a few decades later in the Nazi ideology of a superior Aryan race as the true Europeans concentrated in Germany. The situation at the turn of the 20th century was articulated very starkly by a French political thinker, Georges Sorel, who in 1908 published a text called Reflections on Violence. And there he asked, why is Europe the land of warlike cataclysms par excellence? The answer he offered to this disturbing question was that Europe was, and I quote him, inhabited by a number of races which are singularly opposed to one another in immediate interests, ways of life, and ambitious and ambitions. Europe, he wrote, has no luck. Her inhabitants make bad neighbors. Six years later, the First World War seemed to prove his point, demolishing, at least for the time being, that Enlightenment dream of a European society. Perhaps unsurprisingly, if the First World War appeared to negate the idea of Europe, it also provoked a remarkable outpouring of reflections on precisely that idea. Indeed, between 1919 and 1939, the outbreak of the Second World War, many of the most influential European intellectuals contributed to this rethinking of the idea of Europe. The most striking feature of all this intellectual activity was their focus on what they called the European spirit, the esprit or Geist in German, and its tendency to define Europe in contradistinction to Russia on the one hand and America on the other. That is Bolshevism and unfettered capitalism. Time and again, they see Europe as being threatened from the, e by, from the East and the West. In the 18th and 19th centuries, as I've already mentioned, Europe was repeatedly distinguished from Asia on the grounds that European civilization prioritized the idea of the free individual, whereas Asian civilization was one in which the individual was subsumed within a collective. This was an argument made by people who'd never been beyond uh, the boundaries of what was then considered to be Europe quite often. In the interwar years between 1919, 1918, 1939, Europe was again repeatedly distinguished, as I said, between Russia and America in very similar terms. Uh, I'll just give you uh, one example. The uh, French thinker Paul Valéry, poet and uh, writer. In 1919, he published an essay called The Crisis of the Mind, and he made what was now the very familiar Eurocentric argument that Europe, as he put it, had it within its power to conquer, rule, and organize the rest of the world to European ends. However, he went on to argue in a later essay that the greatness, on the, on the greatness and the decline, as he saw it, of Europe, that the wretched Europeans, the wretched Europeans preferred to play at the game of Armagnacs and Burgundians, that's different parts of uh, France, rather than assume over the whole world the great role that the Romans knew how to assume and to hold for centuries in the world of their time. So, so Valerie is lamenting the fact that Europe is now no longer the center of uh, the world. The power has shifted to the east and to the west. Um, for Valerie, what distinguishes Europe from all other civilizations is that it gave birth to science he sees it. And science, he goes on to argue, had enabled the worldwide domination of nature. He wrote, our science, European science, became a means of power, a means of physical domination, a creator of material wealth, an apparatus for exploiting the resources of the entire planet. This conception of European science is, of course, precisely the one, the consequences of which we are now having to face in the form of climate change the exploitation of the resources of the entire planet. Uh, another example of uh, a thinker of that time focusing on the idea of the European spirit is the German uh, philosopher Hermann von Keyserling. He published a book which was published in Britain in 1928 by Jonathan Cape under the title Europe. And in that book, he explores the characteristics of the various European nations, and he reaches the following conclusion. If our spiritual journey through Europe has taught us anything at all, it has taught us this. We are dealing, in the case of Europe, with an astoundingly manifold, astoundingly riven structure. 
That is why there can be no question of the unification of Europe in the sense of an effacement of all differences as a desirable goal. Another German philosopher, Edmund uh, Husserl, who was the founder of phenomenology, took up the topic, and he argued similarly that the essence of Europe lay in science, in the creation of science. He gave a lecture in Vienna in 1935 on the crisis of, human, of European humanity, and in that lecture, he basically argued that we had gone astray in our understanding of science and in our understanding of knowledge, that we had become too objectivizing, we had forgotten to take account of the human mind in its refracting of um, the world. That was in 1935. In the same year, in southern Germany, his greatest pupil, another philosopher, Mart Martin Heidegger, who was by that time a signed up member of the Nazi party, was also lamenting Europe's decline. For Heidegger, however, it, what, it was that to which science had given birth that was the problem, technology. Technology, he argued, posed the greatest threat to the European spirit. However, there was another threat, or if you like, the threat that technology uh, manifested itself as, and that was Russia and America. Because he wrote, or he delivered in that lecture, the following uh, claim. Europe, he said, was in a great pincers, squeezed between Russia on one side and America on the other. And then he went on to argue that essentially, this is an interesting argument that one finds being made time and again at, the, at that period, Russia and America are the same, the same dreary technological frenzy, the same unrestricted organization of the average man. That was in 1935. Heidegger then had to go silent, uh, relatively silent, in the 19, uh, first half of the 1940s. Uh, he returned to the topic of Europe in the post-war uh, uh, period, but mu in, in very much the same terms. Turning now to that post-war Second, uh, Second World War period, and focusing just for a few moments on uh, what happened then. 1945-1946, was a moment when, again, European intellectuals had to engage with the idea of Europe, this time in the wake of the Holocaust. And one finds there the key argument being made that Europe is still a crucial idea. It's an idea of unity, but in diversity. And one finds that even as conservative a thinker as T.S. Eliot, would stress this principle. So in 1946, he gave some radio broadcasts in Germany on the, what he called the unity of European uh, culture. And he emphasized variety in unity. For Eliot, ultimately, though, that unity was Christianity, um, which by that point was no longer the European force, the, uh, the unifying force that it had been. It was also at that moment in France and Germany again, that thoughts finally turned seriously to a politically united Europe. And the most widely accepted model for that was a federalist one of the kind that had already been uh, debated in the 19th century. The aims of such a federation, uh, or the principal aim of such a federation, was in no small part to create a political and economic bloc that could compete with the United States on the one hand and with the Soviet Union on the other. That's an important point, I think, that one shouldn't forget when one idealizes the EU. It came into being uh, in relation to those powers. Out of what was initially an economic plan, there emerged the political entity, entity that we now know as the European Union. Victor Hugo would doubtless have been delighted, uh, and it's no surprise, I think, that the current president of France, Emmanuel Macron, has identified Victor Hugo as one of his heroes. The sense of Europe as needing to come together in order to withstand the might of these new superpowers to the east and to the west has been one major strand in much post-war thinking of Europe. It's played a significant part, as I say, in the shaping of the EU. The second major strand in that thinking of Europe also has its roots in a, in a tradition extending back to the Enlightenment. And it's this 
idea of, uh, of Europe as a civilization or a mentality or a spirit which was shaped by ancient Greece and ancient Rome and then by Judeo-Christian, uh, the Judeo-Christian inheritance. It asserts that from ancient Greece came philosophy, science, literature, poetics, sculpture, architecture, and politics in the form of democracy. From Roman culture came republicanism, imperialism, and law. From the Judeo-Christian religion came ethics and the idea of the inner life. Thereafter, the defining forces of the European mentality are seen as being the Renaissance, modern humanism, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, nationalism, and colonialism. Out of all of that emerges what are seen to be distinctly European values, and here they are, justice, rationality, democracy, the freedom of the individual, secularism, and tolerance. This positive vision of Europe is often, but certainly not always, um, qualified by the recognition that while Europe may have been the birthplace of science, rationality, democracy, and humanism, its history also includes the Crusades, colonialism, totalitarianism, genocidal politics, and the destruction of the environment. Uh, the Polish writer Joseph Conrad captured this dark side of the European project at the turn of the 20th century in his novella Heart of Darkness, where he writes that all Europe went into the making of the monstrous figure of Kurtz in that novella, whose mission is ostensibly to bring European civilization to Africa, but which ends with him scrawling, exterminate all the brutes. And I think this takes us to the heart of the problem of thinking the idea of Europe today. As I hope to have shown you, if only in, in brief snapshots, the history of the idea of Europe reveals time and again a Eurocentric conception of Europe. Europe is the highest form of Euro, uh, human civilization. Europe is repeatedly seen as the source of all that is best in humanity, of what have become or are becoming planetary phenomena, science, technology, political models, economic models, educational modules, uh, models, ethical models, artistic forms, etc., etc. To take a relatively uncontroversial example, think of the university as an institution. It's clearly an institution that arose in Europe and is now a global phenomenon. And this superiority complex has been the basis on which much barbarity has been committed against what are seen as non-European cultures lacking in any genuine civilization. Now, one of the most encouraging trends, I think, in post-Second World War thinking about the idea of Europe is the recognition that Europe consists of far more than Western Europe, far more than France and Germany, and that voices from Eastern Europe must play a significant role in the thinking of Europe. Furthermore, there has been a growing insistence on the idea that Europe's borders are not really fixed, and that the essence of Europe lies in diversity, not least in religious and ethnic um, diversity. Recent thinkers of Europe, such as the philosopher Jacques Derrida, who was born in Algeria, the psychoanalyst and literary theorist Julia Kristeva, who was born in um, Bulgaria, among others, have championed this idea of Europe as ethnically, linguistically, and culturally diverse. But again, one has to ask oneself if this idea of a diverse Europe is not ultimately another attempt to make the European model one that can serve as a model for the whole world. Can we be sure that when we make that argument, we aren't making the latest version of what might be termed an ideology of Europe first? Eurocentrism, the universalizing of the European, the idea of European civilization as superior to all others, the idea that the European model should be the planetary model, the idea that Europe needs to pull together in order to be able to stand up to perceived political, economic, and cultural threats from the East and the West, Russia, China, America, or from the South, Islam. These, I would like to suggest, are the ideas of Europe that it is today most important for us to reassess critically. If the history of the idea of Europe can teach us anything, then it is that we need to try harder and in a more self-critical spirit. 
If we reflect back on that history, I think one can come to the conclusion that the following idea of Europe might actually have more potential than a reiteration of those previous ideas. Firstly, it is certainly legitimate, and perhaps it's even essential, for us all to embrace the idea of Europe as an entity that would transcend nationalism. Secondly, it is right for us to champion European culture as a culture founded on the appreciation of the values of difference, ethnic, linguistic, and cultural. And it is also right for us to champion the European values that I have referred to of justice, rationality, democracy, the freedom of the individual, secularism, and tolerance. But in doing so, we also need to bear in mind that the idea of Europe is not simply to be mistaken for the idea of the world or for the idea of humanity. And that means, above all, not simply assuming that European values are necessarily world values or that European civilization, if there is such a thing, can simply become world civilization. If the idea of Europe can teach us or can help us to begin to think the idea of the world in a way that does not entail more destruction of peoples, of cultures, of animal and plant life, of the climate, then I think it can do so only if, if we, as Europeans, take a self-critical approach to our own civilization. Personally, I very much hope that the day will come when the idea of Europe proves to have been a good idea, and that the history of that idea is the history of a good idea. And that, like all good ideas, it gives birth to other ideas beyond any currently considered to be European. But for that to happen, European tolerance will have to include a far greater openness to that which is, even today, seen as non-European. And it would also require an appreciation of the fact that European civilization is what it is only because it has been shaped above all by waves of migration, by myriad influences from beyond what might today be thought of as Europe. And by that, I mean not least Asia and Africa. Indeed, and these are my final words on, 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 on the topic before the Q&A, it seems to me that we should work to try and weaken any binary distinction between the European and the non-European. I think we should recognize that there is no purely good idea of Europe. We should remain vigilantly self-critical when we think Europe. We should seek, and it might not even be possible, but we should seek to abandon a Eurocentric, universalizing idea of Europe. We should accept that Europe is a part rather than the essence, the center, or the whole of human civilization. We should recognize that what we might be inclined to see as the non-European is often something that in fact comes from within Europe or that derives from the same sources as the European. We should, in short, try to accept that the true spirit of Europe lies, if anywhere, in humility, in a self-critical spirit, and in a genuine hospitality to the non-European. Thank you very much. Thank you.